Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that is passing wisdom to the next generation of athletes, coaches, and parents to transform leaders on and off the court. And in today's episode, we got a great guest for you today, Lauren Ammon, the founder of Performance Reimagined and the Beyond the Win podcast host. In our conversation today, we talk about an ecosystem of high performance teams. We talk about the importance of instead of lecturing our athletes, let's ask them questions and also how to develop our athletes into better leaders. Let's dive right on in. Hello and welcome to the Bridging Impact Podcast. Lauren, I am thrilled to have you on to talk some beyond the wind, to talk some performance reimagined. So welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. So I'm really excited to dive into our conversation today. You are the second swimmer in about four or five episodes yes. that we have had on. So I'm excited to, you know, talk some shop about that, talk, talk a little Olympics if we ever get there. But diving right in, um, the first question that we always ask, such an easy question is, you know, how has swimming and sports made an impact on your life? It's the root of everything in my life. Um, it, what I always talk about with athletes that we work with is that for the longest time, I believed that it was swimming made me who I was. And I've, with a little bit of reflection, it's that swimming allowed me to find who I am, uh, in the, in the way of, you know, structure is really important into my life in my life that came about because of the swimming routine and of the practice routine. I started swimming at five and I ended at 22, right? I had a lot of structure and routine in my life. The idea of discipline and commitment that, you know, I've made a commitment to this sport or to this action or to this project, whatever the case may be. And because I've made that commitment, I give it everything I have. A lot of that was learned through swimming every single day I showed up and I had to give everything I possibly could because for me, it was really important to get better as an athlete, not necessarily to always compete against my teammates. Obviously, that was part of the part of the equation, but it was more about how do I find the best version of myself? And I think the other, like the biggest, the third component there is also courage, right? Athletes, I think, miss a lot of that. They develop a ton of courage to put themselves into the spotlight and allow others to see them perform in the moment. That takes a ton of courage, which then leads to a lot of resilience because you don't always perform the way you want to with everybody watching you with all these eyes on you. And then how then to bounce back and bring yourself to have the courage again, to do it again. So that's how I would say those three main components is how sports have influenced my life. I definitely share very similar, you know, learnings and influences when it comes to, you know, talking about discipline and structure. And that's some of the things that I crave. And it's kind of interesting that you bring up courage. And I'd love for you to kind of expand on your story of, you know, you talked about you started swimming at five and, you know, you swam through division one at Eastern Michigan and that feeling that you had at the end of you know, your swimming career, can you describe a little bit more of it and how it's kind of helped guide you along in your journey to where you are today? Yeah. So kind of giving the short version of a very long story is that overall I had a very successful swimming career. Um, and anybody with the, who knows the concept of recency, and that's the idea that when we look at something really big, we, we tend to only focus on the thing that ho- happened most recently. And that's what kind of happened at the end of my career. I didn't necessarily have the best or most successful senior year of college. And that is everything that I was really focused on. You know, it was that culmination of all these years that I put into the sport and gave the sport everything I had. I I wanted that last meet, that last year to be absolutely perfect. And it was kind of anything but. Um, And I remember retiring from swimming very happy about what I went through, but disappointed in that last meet and that idea of, ugh, I could have been so much more had I just been able to get out of my own way. And it was that thought that really launched me into all of the next steps in my life, even though at the time 
I really didn't know what to do with that disappointment. For anybody who's transitioned out of sport, I kind of just swept it under the rug and was like, oops, oh, well, don't know what to do about this. So I'm just going to go do something else. And it wasn't until almost two decades later that I really figured out where that disappointment came from and why I had such a hard time dealing with it. And where it came from was I had all of these expectations of what I wanted my last year and I wanted my last meet to look like. It didn't happen. And I didn't know how to process that because it's not as if I had another swim meet to come back to and and, and try again. And, you know, why I had such a hard time with that is that I kept all of it inside. I had no idea until these last few years that almost every retired athlete I've ever talked to has had somewhat of a similar experience of, I didn't, I didn't know what to do when I stopped swimming or soccer or baseball or football, whatever the case may be. And I didn't know how to fill the void of what that meant to me. And so I just kind of like stuck some things in there and then kind of figured out, oh, wait a minute, maybe this isn't what I want. And that's what happened to me. And that's really what launched me into supporting athletic organizations, athletes, coaches, athletic directors, and parents to kind of find that meaning in the moment and then what it means to find the meaning after. That's really important work. And so as we dive into that important work, one of the things that you mentioned is one of the things that you were thinking about as you were reflecting on your experiences, you talked about getting out of your own way. And before we hit record, you kind of talked about the the era of the nineties and the two thousands of like head down, you're fine. And now there's kind of a, a shift right into talking about mental health. Like you mentioned, Michael Phelps is someone who kind of sparked some you know, connections for you in terms of like how you want to approach your work. And so I'm curious, how has your evolution just as a leader yourself really shifted from recognizing the importance of, you know, mental health when it comes to being an athlete? Yeah. And I, I think the world is still kind of, some of the world still holds that put your head down, get over it, you're fine, move on. And then there are others who, who recognize and embrace a little bit more of how do we curate a little bit more healthier mental well-being or overall well-being among athletes. And my own personal evolution is that for a time I believed in the put your head down, get over it, you're fine, move on. And it, it, it can be helpful in some respects because it does allow you to move forward versus kind of get stuck in the moment, depending on how things are going. But the evolution is more about allowing athletes or coaches or parents or athletic directors, right? Anybody in the space to know that it's okay not to always be okay, or know that it's okay that if you're struggling with a performance or you're, 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 quote unquote, trapped in your own emotions or your own thoughts related to our performance. One, that's perfectly normal, right? It's it's normal for athletes because we're so invested in the game, in our race, in the meet, whatever the case may be. We're so invested in ourselves and trying to be the best version that we possibly can be that sometimes it's normal to get stuck in that because you're so attached to the outcome. And allowing athletes or anybody in the athletic ecosystem, as we were talking about, to understand that it's okay and to create a space to explore it. Again, not necessarily get stuck in it, but explore it to understand what does this mean for me? Where is it coming from? And most importantly, how do I get myself out of it? Knowing that I'm not broken, I don't need to be fixed. I'm simply just a human being that whose brain and emotions right now can't necessarily dissect or or get past what I just experienced. That is really the evolution is that it's not about fixing athletes. It's about creating a space to allow them to discover so that they can move on themselves. Because that was the other thing as an athlete. I was a people pleaser. In some respects, I still am a people pleaser. It's something that I'm getting past. But it's always like, well, I want to be able to perform for you. My thought process was, I want to be able to perform for you because you put so much into me. So it's, I want to be able to almost like repay that investment that you've given to me. And so it's, it's, it's creating a space for athletes to really understand how do you get out of it for yourself so that you can learn from it versus just being told what to do and moving on. Cause sometimes that can create, at least it did for me. I had a hard time making decisions when I came out of swimming. Cause I was like, well, I'm so used to just someone telling me what to do. So I'm just 
can you tell me what to do so I can kind of figure this out? But that's the idea of being able to open up some mental well-being space within the athletic world is to support everybody in figuring out how they can move past it through their own talents and skills. So I'm curious, before we dive into the ecosystem part of things, I just have a quick follow-up. When you talk about creating a space to explore, is that like having conversations, spending practice time doing that, being in the classroom? What does that typically look like? Yeah, that can be anything. It can look like anything. But, you know, some of the things that we've experimented with teams is it is about um, doing it during practice time. Because, you know, one of the tenants that we really talk about is that it's just like your physical routine, right? You, you, you're not going to not practice and then show up to a game or a meet or a race and hope that you can do your best. Like you've got to have that, that foundation behind you in order to put yourself in the best position to perform as best as you possibly can. And we say that we use that same tenet because it's what's understood in the athletic world to do that on the mental or the emotional well-being side of the game of having time during practice, not only to talk about it, but to actually practice some of the techniques so that, again, the idea that it's part of your routine, it's kind of ingrained in that quote unquote muscle memory so that when the big moments come, you can exercise it without being like, wait, wait a minute, what, what was I supposed to do? Or what have I tried before? What am I supposed to try? Um, so utilizing time, not only in practice to learn, but also apply. Now, some teams will carve out spe- you know, specific time in a classroom you know, depending on whatever their preference is. But that's what we mean by that is to actually incorporate it into your practice routine. That makes a ton of sense. And so when we're incorporating that into our practice routine, is that, you know, asking questions, you talked about some of these, you know, practicing techniques. Could you give some examples of what techniques could be used? Yeah. So from all different standpoints, right? I'm a big proponent of asking questions. You know, one of the tenets that we talk about is curiosity over judgment in a way to drive curiosity is to ask questions. So so from a coach's standpoint, it's really easy and understandable to get into the mode of here's what you got to do. This is what you're going to do in the game. Here's the technique you follow, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's, It's flipping that script a little bit to say, hey, athlete, what do you think could be most effective in this instance? Or After something has gone, you know, after a play has been practiced or a play has been executed, asking the question of, hey, athlete, what did you notice about that play? And getting the athlete to actually express what they see, what they felt, what they experienced versus the coach saying, "Okay, go do this. Right. It's being able to ask the questions and then allowing the athlete to make the decision in the moment or obviously the next time they go about it. But it's also the same on on the athlete side, right? They get a directive or a comment from a coach and they don't know what to do with it. And it could be as simple as, hey, coach, could you say that a different way? I don't I'm not sure I, I, I really understand. Or, you know, it's again, creating the space. It's opening up an environment where there's a little bit more dialogue of back and forth and questions versus directives from either direction. Other t- that actually applies to parents as well. I, mean, I, I, I am a former athlete and a parent, and there are times when <laughs> maybe I get a little bit too invested in my son's performance. So rather than say, hey, I noticed X, Y, and Z, it's what did you feel during the game? What about that one play? What was going through your mind? And opening it up from a point of curiosity, maybe versus a point of judgment, because it's super easy, right? We're all looking from the outside we can see things that maybe they can't, but rather than place judgment on it, how do we get it from a place of curiosity? But another technique from a, from an athlete's point of view, if we're talking about maybe not spiraling into the uh, negative headspace or the negative emotions, right? A simple technique to really try during practice is sometimes the negative thoughts just come automatically. It's part of just kind of the pattern that's developed. A simple technique is taking, you know, three seconds saying one, two, three, what's the exact opposite of that thought, right? If it's, oh God, I suck. An exact opposite thought could be, wow, I'm really trying my best here. I have an opportunity to learn a lot more, right? It's just getting into the habit of shifting and changing the narrative. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. Shifting the narrative to something you can work with versus something that pulls you down. Right. 
hundred percent. And I think one of the things is I read also before I dive into that comment, I, this is one of my favorite books, the coaching habit, like say less, ask more and change <laughs> the way you lead forever. I'm not sure if you read it, but that totally shifted how I, you know, kind of started approaching. Like at first I was like advice, advice, advice. And I, I read this when I was working with first graders. Right. So of course I know more than a first grader, but then I started like really thinking about it, like asking questions helps them learn more, right? Because when you articulate your own answer, like you're, it's part of the learning process. So that's definitely been a big realization for me. So that's that's a big one for parents and coaches because we always want to, you know, share our thoughts, you know, but it's really important to ask, hey, what do you see on that play? Or, you know, I, I guess, how are you feeling today, right? I'm, instead of being like, you know, being like, you look, you know, tired, right? Asking, you know, like, have, do you have any, you know, extra homework or what's going on, you know, extracurricular wise. So I think asking questions is so important. Um, and I would love to, you know, talk a little bit more about the ecosystem because you referenced the parents, you've talked a little bit uh, about the athletic directors and how it's like, a, it's a big picture, right? It's not just athletes. It's not just coaches. It's like administration. It's the whole sport. It's the whole ecosystem. So I'd love for you to kind of dive into how ecosystems really help drive performance. And before we drive performance, what really is an ecosystem when it comes to athletics? Yeah. So we pull from the traditional definition of ecosystem, right? An ecosystem is, is a set of organisms that are connected in an environment that in some way, shape, or form literally or figuratively feed off one another in order to keep the, the ecosystem going. And so that's how we translated this idea of really looking at a high performance ecosystem. Uh, you know, you and I were talking before we got on on the recording that, you know, a lot of my professional background is in human resources. And as a part of that profession, you're always looking at organizational culture. You're always looking at how points within the organization fit together. And I, that's how I translated a lot of this into the athletic world, because there are, there's a lot that can be pulled from the athletic world into the business world, from the business world, into the athletic world. And that's kind of where the inspiration of this idea of the ecosystem ecosystem came from was in my HR days, you know, we'd be putting something together where it would be a manager development program, but where it would fall flat is if their leader didn't understand what they were learning, how to reinforce it, or their employees had no idea what was going on and how they, how they could reinforce it from their point of view. And so we just translated that into the athletic ecosystem that if we're working with athletes to support them on the mental well-being side or emotional well-being side of the game, that's great. They're the ones out there performing, doing everything they possibly can to keep the team moving forward, but so are the coaches. So are the athletic directors. And in some ways, so are the parents. And so we translated that idea of how do we create connection between all of what can be sometimes seemingly disparate groups and bring them together to advance the performance of everyone involved, not just athletes, but to create an opportunity for coaches to have more development, to create more opportunity for parents to be involved in a way that supports the overall culture. It's more than just the culture of how we look at it. It's how each individual plays a role in advancing the performance of the organization, but how they all come together to then advance the performance of the team or the organization. Right. And which is so important because everyone plays a role in that. But when it comes to everyone playing a role, like I think one of the things like I have conversations with other coaches and, you know, some things I read, it's like sometimes it's like as a coach, you can feel like and this is not my position, but just like yeah. for other coaches that I've talked to, like they feel like administrators like aren't on their side or, you know, how do we as as a coach right as a part of the ecosystem work with you know parents and administrators and try and get everyone at, on in a similar culture when they may not be the ones setting the culture does that make sense yeah and and that's what makes some of this work challenging is that you kind of got to dissect and like take a take a step back and one of the tenants that we talk about Within our organization, we follow seven uh, main principles as a part of performance reimagined. The second one is sometimes roles, always goals. And what that really means is no matter 
what kind of athletic institution you are, whether you're a school, whether you're a club team, whether you're a college, you know, anything in between is that at the end of the day, everybody connected to that ecosystem is after one thing, to perform as best as you possibly can. And if that works out, that you win, right? I mean, every team is out there trying to win, trying to be the best that they can. We have roles within an organization to make sure that it's not just chaotic, right? Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing and that there's a little bit more structure and framework in terms of how you advance that performance. But at the, at the root of all of that is that you're all connected at, this, at the root level in terms of trying to be the best version you can as an individual, trying to bring that all together to be the best version as a team, and then to win. So when it's all about, you know, when you're so focused on roles, it's like everybody's trying to hold on to their respective power in whatever way that's related to the role that you hold. But that's why we talk about sometimes roles always goals. So that there, if there is this disconnect between a coach and an athletic director or administration, or there is a disconnect between a coach and a parent, or there's a disconnect between a coach and an athlete, whatever, you know, they're all kind of spokes in their own little wheels, is to take that step back and say, okay, what is it that we are all truly after together? And then how do we bring our own individual strengths to the table? fill in the gaps of where each of us have them so that we can all move forward together. And again, theoretically, that sounds great. It's perfect. You know, all, you know, golden city on the hill, recognizing that there are always humans involved and there's always different perspectives. And that's where we take it back to our first principle, which is get to know the human underneath. That's always the basis of everything that we always do is not only get to know the human underneath of who you are as an individual, but then looking at each individual as a human knowing that they have different perspectives, how do we bring all that together to advance not only an individual, but the group as a whole? I think that's amazing. I mean, I'm a big believer in get to know the human first. Like I'm definitely like I always trying to dap up my players before, you know, any session starts or try and acknowledge coaches um, or, or really anyone, right? Like I think just acknowledging people is number one, right? That's like the fundamental beginning of, of getting to know them and then talking about what we talked about earlier with like asking questions right and getting to know people i think that's really important and then i haven't heard that before sometimes rules always goals and i think that's you know an important framework and like you said like it may not always be a kind of a perfect fit but you know i had a conversation with a parent the other day just about an athlete's you know certain behavior and it's like we have the same goal we want to develop the the, the athlete to you know become the best athlete he can be, best leader he can be. And, you know, we maybe uh, disagreed about uh, some things in terms of like philosophy, but we came to agreements in terms of like where we want this athlete to go. Right. And so I think just having those conversations are, it is really important. And so can you talk about, you know, share any examples from your work, um, whether it be, you know, HR work or your work now with athletes and coaches in terms of ecosystems about how you help handle, you know, some of those conflicts to find goals to, you know, get beyond some of those, you know, discrepancies. Yeah. And, and again, that, that goes back to doing a lot of core and foundation work. And mm -hmm. it's the idea of setting the principles upon which the team or organization will operate from and ensuring one that they align to the culture, the atmosphere, the ecosystem that you want to create. And beyond that, that they're understood at every level. So you can, you know, in our organization, we have seven different principles that we follow. And anytime that we interact with a team or bring on, you know, whether it be a, a team member inside is to to ensure that they understand those seven principles and allow them the opportunity to create a little bit of their own meaning. Like, what does it mean for me to get to know the human underneath? How do I do that as an individual versus what you may do? Neither of them are right or wrong. They're just different. And it's all about creating that foundation so that when conflicts arise, you can go back to those principles and say, hey, this is what we agreed to as an organization. This is how we're going to put them out. This is how each of us interpret them. And that's why I say it's really important to pull even parents into those principles. 
is to help them understand that this is what, as an institution or a club or a school or whatever the case may be, this is what we believe in. Here's how we see you playing a role in that. How do you see yourself playing a role in that? How do we come back to these foundation principles to then relieve whatever tension or conflict we have? And in some ways, sometimes being okay that they may actually be different. It's just that there needs to be an agreement of how how the team can move forward after a conflict. I mean, at the end of the day, and even in my athletic experience and my own personal experience, watching my sons be an athlete at this time, even in the corporate world, all conflict is rooted in just a misunderstanding of what you believe and what I believe, and that there may be some differences in there. And I firmly believe that the simplistic action of having an open and honest and curious conversation around those differences is the most effective thing on this planet. Right. Open, honest, and curious. I like that. I'm writing that down because when we come to a conversation in terms of like, hey, this is my side, I'm right, you know, like this is how we're going to do it, right? It's going to set the wrong tone right away and we're not going to reach that goal like you talked about, but, you know, having those conversations. But I do feel like those conversations actually are healthy and actually bring, you know, people together, right? Whether you're talking Mm -hmm. about partner relationships, you're talking about teams, right? It could be parent and coach, right? Like, I think those are really important um, kind of values to go by. And one of the things that I think about a lot and, you know, sparked my curiosity when you talked about it at the beginning is, is leadership development and it's specifically leadership development for athletes, because that's what we're hoping to do with our basketball and leadership program. I'm curious, you know, as through your leadership experience, what do you think are, are what process or principles do you practice when it comes to developing athletes' leadership capability? Because oftentimes, like you mentioned, coaches just will thrust the best player into the leadership role, but they may not have the leadership skills to lead a team. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, that's something, and you, you kind of touch on this too, is that sometimes in the corporate world, that's what you, you can notice, right? The best players thrust into a leadership position because they're the best player. And part of that journey is is it goes back to that first principle is getting to know the human underneath, right? So Mm. uh, I'll give you a specific example for me, but my entire career, I was like, I want to be a leader. 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 Had someone probably sat me down when I was probably, I don't know, 18, 22 and helped me kind of maneuver the path. I may have said, maybe I don't want to be a leader. I was only saying it because that in my mind, it was like, oh, well, you know, the the best people are chosen as leaders, maybe not the best leaders are chosen as leaders. So from a young developing athlete standpoint, it's it's about getting to know the human underneath and getting curious with them about what it is they actually want, but also being open in terms of, hey, here's what I see you you know, providing, again, going, we were talking about before, like getting curious and pre- providing advice. Like there's a, there's a lovely balance between those two things. Getting curious allows the athlete or, or anyone you're talking to, to provide their insights, but then you can reflect back to them and potentially you see something in them that they don't see in themselves. And so when there are, you know, sometimes the best players, the best technicians, the best skilled may not be the most skilled at leadership. There could be someone who is considered a quote unquote B player or a quote unquote a C player who may actually demonstrate more or more effective leadership qualities. And if that is the case, then I'm a big proponent of how then can you support that athlete in a completely different way to bring them to a leadership position? And I recognize on a on an athletic team that you you typically want your best players, to be the captains, to be at the forefront. But I also think you can find a delicate balance between, hey, you can still have some of the most skilled people be captains or leaders with on the team. You could also pinpoint those who may not be the most skilled or technician or technique wise to provide a different perspective of leadership on the team. And And to your point, I believe everyone is a leader in their own way because it comes from their strengths. That's what they get to be a leader in. And it's being able to identify what those strengths are and then lifting athletes in that respect or providing development opportunities for them to accelerate those skills and be a leader in their own right, regardless of what role they play on the team. 
So what do you say one of the most important aspects of, of it, whether it's a coach or a parent, or it could be even, you know, a, an administrator, right? If you see it in terms of a coach, like, hey, let's say I have this athlete. Um, hey, Luke, you know, and this is actually an athlete and, and he's one of my, you know, athletes that is most consistent that works with me. Um, he consistently like likes to give, you know, kind of feedback to other athletes like, hey, I, I noticed that you are really involved and engaged with helping your teammates kind of be their best. Um, and so just kind of recognizing that that's a great leadership skill, like continuing to hone in on it, but you may want to be careful that you don't want to give too much advice, you know, cause that could be something like a leadership skill that, you know, I've learned as a coach. Right. And so kind of almost recognizing the skills within our own athletes, you know, in, in, in asking those questions, kind of going back to what we we're talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And almost in that particular instance, it could be, Hey, Luke, it looks like you are phenomenal at being able to recognize patterns and how to improve something. What might it look like to invite the, your teammate in into saying, what, what patterns do they see? And then creating an invitation. Hey, would you be open to seeing what I saw or hearing what I saw? Right. It's just, it, again, it's creating that space for someone to walk into versus opening a door and saying, Hey, come into my room. I'll tell you how it's going to go. Cause that's something I've always had to deal with too. One of my superpowers is recognizing patterns and saying, Oh, Hey, Hey, if we just did this, this, it, it would make it a lot better. What I've had to learn is not everybody's always receptive to that feedback uh, right. in, at a particular moment or potentially in a particular way that I present it. And so it's about learning those nuances within yourself and then just tweaking it and, playing around with how others may respond and finding ways that, oh, that one really worked. I'm going to keep that one in my back pocket. Asking the question is much better than direct giving the directive. Right, right. Exactly. And, and then they get to come up with their own answers. So when it comes to, you know, leadership and, and you've got the opportunity to be on athletic teams and, and work as a, you know, with a ton of athletic teams I, and like we talked about, leadership looks different for every single person, right? Whether we're an athlete or we're not. And I'm just curious, have you noticed any like certain common threads that, you know, kind of run through, you know, a athletes or just leaders in general, right? Yeah, I would say actually one of the biggest threads is curiosity. That idea that uh, I'm more willing to be open to learn from you than maybe what I feel you could learn from me. So that idea of curiosity, I would also say coachability. And again, that comes from the athletic space of those who are willing to have a beginner's mindset in that, Hey, I'm not, I'm not always the greatest thing at, at everything I touch. Uh, I'm willing to, to learn from somebody else and to be open to what they have to say. Um, the other is resilience. And I, I tell this story a lot in that I had the opportunity of speaking to uh, a gold medal Olympian and uh, in swimming. And he said something to me that really stuck with me in terms of athletes can almost be overdeveloped in resilience. And by that is we're really good at getting knocked down, standing right back up and putting our heads down and, and moving forward where sometimes we miss the opportunity is something we were talking about before is processing what we actually went through. Like, what, what, what did that mean for me? Like, what, what did I actually feel? What led me to feel that way? Why did I, why did I feel stuck in that moment or whatever the case may be is that, you know, we're so good at it that we just get up, get right back down, get knocked down, get right back up. Um, and so that idea of kind of taking a pause in that resilience to say, Hey, what can I learn from that versus just brushing right past it and, you know, hoping it never happens again, or, or, or I'll just deal with it next time it happens. Right. Kind of thing. So I would say those three are probably some of the biggest themes that I've see, seen is curiosity, coachability, and resilience. Right. Learn using, you know, losses or, yeah. you know, setbacks, missing, missing shots as a learning opportunity versus like, just brushing it off. And, and there's probably an art, right? A balance of like, you probably don't want to like in game be like, Oh, why did I miss that shot and not run back <laughs> on defense? Or like, you know, if you're swimming and I don't know much about swimming, but if you don't like, you know, I don't know, a couple of your strokes are a little bit off. You probably don't want to overanalyze it. Right. So there's an art to it. Um, yes. 
but also just recognizing maybe building that space at the end of a practice or at the end of a game or after a game, right? And that's a conversation, you know, between parent and coach or coach and athlete where we can talk about some of those different things and, and making sure that I think becoming clear with that. Cause I think sometimes I know in the past, like I have encouraged certain things and then I can watch athletes maybe think a little bit too much. Right. So it's, it's again, mm -hmm. coaching is that art, right? Leadership mm -hmm. is that art to kind of, you know, figuring out how to learn from certain situations. But I think, you know, it's kind of interesting that you talk about curiosity being a number one value. That's actually one of our values at, at BTG basketball, our basketball program, because we want to build lifelong learners and, um, you know, coachability is actually one thing that I wrote, like I did like little three subcategories and coachability came on it too. So it's kind of funny how much synergy there is here because I feel yeah. like curiosity does like that. It helps you get to know your teammates more, gets, gets to know yourself more. And those are really important aspects and traits to them be successful in, in the business world or whichever world you pursue after athletics. Yeah, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. It's like in terms of resilience, and I appreciate you pointing that out is not necessarily always in the game, right? Because you don't always have that time, right. uh, but carving space sometime shortly thereafter to just do that quick kind of review for yourself, take the lesson and apply it to next time. Exactly. So with your, you know, podcast, I'm curious, you know, kind of as we enter, you know, the last lap of our episode or the two minutes left in the fourth quarter, what would you say is your favorite part of being a podcast host? Because I, I have my favorite parts. Like I love learning from, you know, people like yourself who, you know, we share obviously similar values, but you say a couple of different little nuggets here and there that, you know, I pick up on and I can like, you know, bring back to my athletes. But what's your favorite part of being a, a, a podcast host? Yeah. So for our, our podcast is all about one of our taking a step back a little bit because it'll tying to the answer is that one of our principles yeah. as an organization is one size fits one. And the idea that every single person has their own success formula. And, and as you were talking about before, the, the art of leadership is getting to know each individual as an individual and creating a success formula for them. So that's the whole premise of our Beyond the Win podcast is that we bring on current athletes or previous athletes and allow them the opportunity to create awareness in terms of what their success formula was so that any listener can pick and pull any insight they want and try to add it to their own success formula. If it works, great. If it doesn't throw it out, try something else, right? It's all about kind of experimentation. And the thing that I have loved most about that is regardless of sport, it, athletics is transcending, right? It doesn't matter if you played basketball, you swam, you ran track, you played football, you played baseball insert whatever sport, we've all been up against some of the same things. And it's fascinating to learn and to be an observer of how many different options there are to find success. There is no one path. There is no defined journey that we all must follow in order to find success. No, it truly is about each of us as an individual and to hear how someone else applies resilience or how someone else faced adversity or how someone else found their spot in their team when they didn't first get the position they want or made the team that they wanted and how they got themselves through that. That's what I love most about it. I love that. And I think one of the most important aspects I heard you kind of talk about is like curiosity kind of comes through all of that, right? Like when I'm discovering my success formula, right? Like it may look different from, from Lawrence or, or Luke's like we talked about, but that's because I'm using my own curiosity to discover my own values and discover what my own strengths are. And so those, if we can teach our athletes how to be curious about themselves and what gifts they bring to a team, strengths, you know, potentially challenges and things that they need to work on, like for me, maybe organization and finding someone who can make my podcast look pretty like yours, um, you know? So I think just recognizing some of those things is what's really important. And so, you know, where can people, you know, find and listen to your podcast and, and connect with you because you had so much great wisdom to share? Yeah, you can find the podcast on, on any platform. It's called Beyond the Win. Uh, we've had a lot of great guests on so far, a lot of baseball players and soccer players. It's been fascinating in terms of being able to listen to their differences there too. Um, you can also find us on 
at on Instagram at performance underscore reimagined underscore. And then of course at performancereimagined.com. We have links to everything on there. Uh, and, and you can contact us. You can follow us. You can engage with us. We are always willing to, to be a part of the team because that's what we know and love. Awesome. Well, thank you so much today, Lauren. I really enjoyed our conversation and I'm excited to release this episode to our audience. Oh, thank you so much. This was great. I appreciate your interview style. You are absolutely uh, brilliant you. at your questions. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts. And this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward, make an impact on the world. So stay tuned, stay subscribed. Cheers.